normally do the way that we normally do our business uh, office is that I, I just ask people. We don't have a lot of people on, so I, uh, I just ask people to uh, chat in any questions that they may have. The um, I have uh, a colleague monitoring the questions, and they will. She will then um, put them up on a display for me to see, and we'll. I'll see. The, do my best to answer them. We do have a question that came from last uh, presentation, and it was from the last webinar. It said, in the presentation next week, can you show the basics of creating a spreadsheet tab with multiple graphs on one tab, pulling from tables which are in other tabs, how to create the dashboard look? So I'm going to switch over to share my uh, screen and show you that uh, one second. Okay. So what you should be seeing is my an Excel spreadsheet and we've landed on staff productivity tab. And in that tab in in this uh, spreadsheet you'll see that we have a staff spreadsheet a program spreadsheet and then a client spreadsheet uh, sheet. So one of the ways that you can think about doing this is to many, at least the, the model I'm showing you right now, the visualizations are built off of um, off of pivot tables, and these are just pivot charts. Well, one of the things that you can do is to basically have your pivot tables in the background if you think that they don't add anything to the visualizations, you'll see what I've done is sort of coordinate uh, the pivot tables with the slicers, which are your filtering technique, and also with the graphs. But if you wanted to really sort of drive the graphs into a single location, then I would go ahead and um, create a create another sheet. Let's call it uh, well, let's call it dashboard. Uh, one of the things you're going to want to do is sort of stage your sheet. So um, the first thing I do is go into my view and take off the grid lines. So you have a nice blank screen in the background. Uh, then I would put a, a basic header in here. Uh, I'd go back to home and I'd get a merge and center. I'm going to highlight these cells. I'm going to call this, um, oops, let's call this performance dashboard. And then simply what you do, you know, to create a, a, a pleasing environment, just use some of the uh, functionality in Excel. So when I go over here, I created, let's create another dashboard, let's create another visualization, but let's create it off uh, this pivot table here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in to um, insert, and then I'm going to insert a pivot chart. It's going to give me all the different options on what the pivot chart. Let's add a simple one here say OK. You'll see it's going to load it into the uh, sheet where you had generated the pivot table. So if I'm going to want to change that, then I can go into my chart. And in my design tab for the chart, I can move the chart. It gives you an option to create a new sheet or move the object into an existing sheet. So let's use our dashboard sheet as an example and say OK. Then you have the ability to start moving those around. Um, what you'd probably want to do is add slicers to this and uh, create a 
or a visual environment by creating a tab and putting your visualizations inside of that tab. One of the things that you may want to think about is the fact that, or understand, is how the slicers work. Oops. So let's go back into this tab. Each of the slicers have a options uh, menu inside of Excel. They have some limited uh, functionality, columns, height, width. Um, you can put in the forward, send it to the background. You can select a, a frame. You have some settings, but this is really where you want to take a look. You can set up your slicers to filter on multiple tables. So you'll pivot tables. So you'll see the particular slicer I'm working with, staff name. When changed, it can change the chart one that we just created, um, service summary, and our unit analysis. So you can bring you can bring your um, you can bring your filters um, into your different uh, your different tabs, and then have them control. And in this case, I did a cut, a cut and I'm pasting it, so I'm moving it in here. And you'll see that my visualization changes as I change those, um, that filtering. So if you want to work in the, um, in the environment here, then I would create a separate tab. I'd clean up the background, put some uh, color into it, and then you can create a number of pivot tables in the background and have your visualization come to a single sheet. And if you really want to control that and you want, want, and you want a nice, clean environment, uh, you can take the sheets that you use to develop your um, visualizations and just hide them or protect them, either way you want to do it. So then you can create an Excel environment that has um, some, uh, and more, looks more, lo more like a dashboard. Um, this one that I created here, um, let's unhide that sheet, I felt that the pivot table metrics were important metrics. And you can build some a bit of a you know KPI kind of a here's a key performance indicator. You're either good, bad, or uh, low on it, and you can then add some additional information that's maybe not as easy to add into a data visualization. The other option that you have, and Microsoft's really worked away from it, is a concept called, they have an add-in called Power View. Let me actually see if I have it on, I'm going to my add-ins, and I'm going down to Excel add-ins, it's a com add-in. I'm going to see if, well, I have Microsoft Power View for Excel. So Power View is a bit more of a development environment uh, that, that allows you to build those kind of visualizations inside of your Excel in more of a visualized view. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, I'm looking through to find out where the insert is for a Power View, um, and I'm at a loss to find out how you bring your Power View in. You also have an opportunity to bring field maps in. You can do 3D maps. Um, you can do some of these kind of win-loss uh, spark lines. So there is, oh, here it is, way over on the right. So you could bring this in and take a look at working on opening a Power View sheet. You'll see that the Power View sheet is really a blank uh, development sheet. 
that will allow you to build some of your visualization. So let's see if we can do this real quick on the fly because I'm not seeing any other questions come through. So I'm playing this by ear. I haven't done this in a long time. So I could probably come in and bring a, a program unit in. Let's bring that uh, and well, let's see, you'll see I brought my program unit in over here and then let's go and take a look at our data and let's do billable hours time and move that into here also and you'll see billable hours. We can build slicers on this. You can build bar charts. Um, and you'll see that it's developing here. We brought billable hours in as a field. You can build your titles. So what this allows you to do is to take a pivot table, sort of create an environment here and then tell it what kind of charts you want. There's PowerView has some limited functionality as it relates to building um, building your charts. So if you really want to up your game, then what you want to go to is um, no, one second while I get over so I can open uh, the BI desktop. So let me show you this real quick as we wait for any other questions to come in. Um, one second. It takes a second to load, and I'll move it into the screen that I'm sharing. So as I mentioned on the last one, the, our last meeting, the BI desktop is really a development tool that has incorporated the data query and the um, data visualization and the power pivot into a single tool. And it sits on, they call it the Power BI Desktop because it's their primary development tool uh, that they use with Power BI. Power BI is their uh, cloud-based uh, visualization deployment tool that is available to you in a couple of different flavors. There at least, last time I looked, there was a free flavor. And then, um, as with many of the applications, you get additional functionality as you buy up into their um, uh, Power BI Pro. And you can also get a server version that will allow you to uh, really deploy it in your environment. We started with the Excel tools as a way of really uh, orienting people to the kind of functionality that they have living on their desktop right now. And I thought that that was an important starting point. Um, but if you're really looking to build out your environment, uh, then you, your next step would be to move to your uh, BI desktop. So here's the BI desktop, and in that BI desktop, you'll see some of the basic functionality. So what we did is, you know, get data. So here you can go and you can get data. Let's say we're going to get data from Excel, and um, let's go and pull a demo data bring that data up. It's doing the data connection, just as we talked about when we did the get and transform. You have an opportunity. Let's take a look at uh, data. These are exactly the ways that we went through it before. You can edit it. You can. You have all the functionality that you have inside of uh, Power Query and Power Pivot. And you'll see this is, looks very much like what we were doing before. It enters uh, your steps. You can go in and change it. You can do your uh, source. You can then enter your data. What are we going to do? We're going to close and apply. Uh, and it's going to bring it into a data model that's now available for us to work in. 
the you can create visualization series so and we can create data models um, so if you and then so this is really the if you're going to move forward this is the environment that you want to start working in not only because it incorporates all the tools into a single view but also you'll see that it has a um, pretty robust set of, um, of visualizations. Uh, if you see up in the right hand corner you have your stacked bar graph, you have your column chart, uh, clusters, um, cluster columns, but then you can start getting into maps. You can do tree maps, it does donut charts, uh, pie charts, you can do funnel charts, um, gauges, cards. So once you've gone move beyond your basic functionality inside of uh, Excel, you've sort of, uh, the process that I go through is to start at the desktop with Excel because there's so much work that has to go on before you really start your visualizations. Um, I always build prototypes. I connect to my data. I understand, I vet my data. I understand what my data relationships need to be. I put together simple pivot tables, uh, build my measures, build my KPIs, and then move forward from there in starting to do some development in, um, in here. So let me see if I can show you something that was built here. Let's take a look at an executive dashboard. It's uh, initializing my model here, so it may take a second uh, to load that. Uh, but you're able to then create what would really be a true visualization environment. So you can add pages, add visualizations. Uh, it's a little bit slow in initializing your model. Uh, let's see what I got here. All right, so let's bring this forward. So this is a, a visualization that I had built for um, an executive leadership kind of a dashboard. And actually this was then, uh, we used it, the mobile version. So you'll see you have a, a number of different, um, here I had expense and revenues. You can put filters on it so you can change your filters, um, added program FTEs, clients served by quarters, program expenses, you'll see the different types of graphs. They all have this overlay, so you can point to uh, any one data point and you can get your data metrics. Can't see this real well, but this is a KPI. It shows you your, your gives you a little X here because it's where you wanna be. It shows you the change over time. Here's a gauge, here are area graphs that uh, show you your two different variables uh, in two different colors. Uh, it's a much more visually appealing environment uh, to build out your uh, true dashboards, but it was really beyond the scope of the work that we could do in three sessions, basically, in introducing concepts. Uh, but you'll see if I go into this, um, you can do a fair amount of formatting. It really is the environment that you want to begin moving towards. You can then take these visualizations that you build and you can publish them out to a, um, to a, a Power BI um, environment and deploy this in a much more across an organization. This one actually was built to be deployed on a mobile phone. And uh, if you go in, let's see if I can do it here. Um, uh, I forgot where this is. Let's do view, the phone layout view. And it will show you what it would actually look like inside of a 
a phone and how you would then organize your data differently. So it has a great deal of power to it. Uh, Power BI gets updated pretty much. Or the BI desktop gets updated uh, pretty much every month, and um, we do see that um, they are adding functionality, uh, pretty significant functionality across the board. That's a very long-winded uh, answer to a question, but uh, we hadn't seen anything else come in. So um, really open up any questions that anybody else might have, uh, specifically related to the work that we've done or any uh, other kind of all right, so where does the data come from in this dashboard? How would it be updated monthly? So in a dashboard like this, this really actually comes from different data sources. So you'll see that my expense and revenue data by quarter um, is coming from a my financial data set. So I have an ability to direct to connect directly to our financial data, which is in a uh, SQL data set. Uh, the, some of the activity data, say FTEs by quarter, comes from our HR system. Uh, client served by quarter comes from our uh, electronic medical record. Annual turnover comes from our HR systems. FTE per month comes from an HR system. Current ratio comes off of my accounting, my financial statements, along with line of credit. So what you can basically do is you, you have a development environment. You connect to your different data sources. Once you connect to your data sources, you bring them together. You build your data model, uh, as we talked about last week. And if you're developing inside of this ex, ex, um, uh, BI, desktop, then you're able to build your visualizations right here and deploy it um, using the BI, Power BI. So the data can come from a number of different places. The other way that you could do this, you could take a look at, this is really pretty simple data. So another way to attempt to go at this is instead of trying to connect to your different data sources and pull your data directly, you could build a fairly simple uh, Excel spreadsheet and have different people responsible for putting data into that spreadsheet. But this is data that most, mostly you already have. So you're doing your you're doing your financial statements on a month by month basis. So you know what your expenses and revenues and surplus are. That's coming out of your um, activity uh, statement of activity. So you could have somebody on your finance team have an Excel spreadsheet that's available um, on your network that they would go in and put that number in. And what we would do is. This data in the top left-hand corner is a summary, but this data is the same data because this is loaded on a month-by-month -month basis. So we load it, it's the same data. In this case, we're using what they call a card to aggregate your data, and in this one, we're using a graph to show the difference quarter over quarter. What I like about this is that you can create, you can put two variables onto the same graph. So I have the, my expense variable and my revenue variable, and you'll see that, uh, you know, in this instance, this is demo data, by the way, that in my third quarter, I had a very high margin between my revenues and expenses, but by the fourth quarter, they have come together, and if I had a first quarter of the next year, we may have seen this graph change. Uh, so, but this is basic data that you could bring in. Here's expense and revenue data by program. You probably have some kind of monitoring system, that, at least for your most important or 
your largest programs where you're looking at program expense and program revenue um, on a monthly basis. You can aggregate this again, have somebody to drop that into a simple spreadsheet and you can aggregate it. So you can build a relatively robust reporting environment by taking four or five or maybe six key data elements that you're reporting out in different places at different times by different people and just aggregating them into a simple, simple spreadsheet. Again, this is data that we're collecting anyways, but what we don't have is an integrated environment for taking a look at this. Um, so what part of what we want to do, and that's what the dashboards are, and part of certainly my recommendation to people is to begin integrating your dashboards. You'll see here's an example of integration that took in data, financial data, it took HR data, it took some clinical data, and it put it together into a single visualization because what we're going to want to start to do and think about is informing executive leadership and program leadership not only just in specific domains, but across multiple domains. I've seen these dashboards where they uh, bring in uh, marketing information or um, client satisfaction or provide, uh, patient satisfaction data and merge this into a, a dashboard. This is more of an executive suite dashboard. Um, so that's, that's really what. So the, I had a question regarding this. So you publish to Power BI, where does that live? It lives primarily in the cloud. You have two ways of doing that. If you, you take a look at, if you use the BI, Power BI cloud version, that gets posted to the cloud. And that's a bit more of an open environment. So uh, you have to be really careful um, because you could be, you can't, you should be careful about exposing PHI to that kind of environment. Um, there is some functionality. The next question was, can you, or the second option is, is they, did, they do have an on-premise version of the Power BI server where you could bring that functionality in-house. So instead of posting it to the cloud, you post it internally, and then you can certainly control at a much more granular level uh, user access to the data. Uh, some people think about having sort of this C-suite or executive leadership dashboard, and then a second level that does program-related, um, so that service line managers or program managers could see data. And you could go down to another level that has clinical supervisor data, and you could go down to a final level where it has uh, provider level data, and that's when you start getting into the PHI, when you begin looking at uh, your clients, your services you're providing to them, uh, population, doing population uh, management. So PHI actually in the deployment environment is an important consideration. So if you're thinking of going down this path, the first thing that I do would do is download the um, BI uh, desktop. Um, and that will give you the full tool set and a, a robust visualization environment. That's only after I think that you've really taken a good look at those tools inside of Excel, understand them, play around with them a little bit. The learning curve when you you move that level of knowledge over into the BI desktop is not huge. So I think that it gives you a bit of a development environment uh, that allows you to um, understand your basic functionality at the back end. Um, so. Um, that would be my recommendation, and then start working in this environment. It says, I noticed R listed in the box under visualizations. Um, how does R integrate? Uh, let's see. Let's see what, what happens to do that. Uh, R script editor. 
I will be perfectly honest with you. I have not worked in this R script editor, but it seems to provide you with a script editor that R script visualizations are not enabled. All right, you just you just walked beyond my level of expertise. So I think that um, bringing the BI, does, I mean, if you really are understanding, you understand our script. There's a whole level of functionality then that's available to you. What I would do is get the BI de a desktop tool, um, get on some of the um, Microsoft training tools, and see how that would integrate. Uh, let's see, any other statistical software packages? Well, I think that I'm not I'm not really familiar with a lot. I know that the um, when you get into data analytics and particularly data visualizations, uh, the reviews that I've seen out there have really mentioned two tools at really at the top of the game, particularly around visualizations. And those are the Microsoft BI tools, Power BI, BI Desktop. The other tool that always rises to the top is Tableau. Uh, Tableau has a very rich uh, visualization environment. I had actually started my development using Tableau, um, and um, I, you can do you can do a lot in Tableau. The visualizations are very rich. Um, your ability to manage across uh, multiple data sets is the same. Uh, I started doing my development work in Power BI and in the Excel BI tools because those were tools that were on my desktop. I was familiar with Excel. I was familiar with the Excel formula languages. I felt comfortable. I had a number of individuals on my team uh, that were at least at the level of intermediate um, um, Excel users. And so I really, I, I left Tableau and started doing most of the development inside of Excel. There were tools available. We, there was not as high of a learning curve with that. Um, it had the level of functionality I wanted. And the second, and actually for me, an extremely important aspect of the Excel tools is, is that although it provides a very rich analytic environment for visualizations, sometimes you just want to do little simple one-offs that you, know, you don't need a full-blown development, you don't need this full visualizations. You, know, you need to, to create a small little data model uh, take a look at your data, fool around with it. You know, somebody asked you a question you think is meaningful and you need data from a couple different sources. And if you see, test out your assumptions. Um, and so those were the tools that I had in place. Also, uh, the tools are very useful for your finance team. They're useful for aggregating data for your HR folks. Uh, so I thought that I, I wanted to leverage the resources that I had. But I think if you're thinking about taking a look at other other tools available to you for doing visualization, I know that there are a number of tools on the market. The only other one that I'm aware of and has have utilized is Tableau, and I think that that is a great tool also. Um, so other questions that folks may have before we maybe uh, wrap this series up. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions come through, so I'd like to thank you guys for hanging out to the bitter end. Um, if, in fact, there are additional questions that come up, um, we did share with you the MCTAC email uh, right here. So you can send any additional questions to us at mctac.info uh, at nyu.edu. Um, 
And if you have suggestions about moving this conversation forward and maybe moving in a little bit to the BI desktop tools or additional development or thinking about other ways we can think about and organize our data to support decision making, then shoot your um, shoot your uh, suggestions along to mctac.info at nyu.edu. Uh, I put in the subject line uh, BI, uh, something that related to BI, so it gets uh, sent to the right place. And um, I'd be happy to think about uh, moving this conversation forward. I think the key thing for me right now in the, my development and my thinking is how we begin bringing data from different organizational domains and bringing them into a single analytic environment so we can begin understanding not only finance but um, our, how HR, our benchmarks are on human resources or our quality improvement, how some of our clinical outcome data, client satisfaction data, because um, really management of organizations as we move forward into the value-based environment really needs for us to start getting out of our org operational silos. Uh, finance needs to talk with mm, clinical leadership HR needs to be talking with those. We really need an environment that's more robust that really speaks to all the different variables in our organization and the interdependencies that exist there. So these are the really tools that we want to begin thinking about and putting in our environment that allows us to get a more complete understanding of our operations, allows our different domain and service line leadership to be talking the same language, looking at the same data, understanding how the work that's being done in other domains impacts uh, the challenges that they're trying to face. And at the end of the day, what you really want to be able to do is show how all these inputs are, are really speaking to better quality, better services, better accessibility for your for your clients. So um, I had started about in this conversation about uh, you know a strategy. And if the one suggestion that I have for you around strategy is starting with a strategy of of how you're going to what's the conversation going to be in your organization as it relates to uh, provisioning data, who is going to see it? How transparent are you going to be? What are the processes going to be to make sure that uh, the individuals who need this data to make that dis their decisions get the data, get the data in a timely fashion, understand what it means, be able to drill into it, and really begin driving performance based upon some of the decisions and some of the data that's available to them to do that. So your strategy is not necessarily just around tools. I think your strategy is what does a what does the performance driven environment look like? What how do we want our leadership to what language do we want them to speak? What kind of data do they we want them to have? How does this data inform decision making across different domains and different operational environments and different programs? And how do we begin talking about how these different factors interrelate to each other and impact each other uh, so we can make decisions not based upon some narrow strip of data that we're looking at, but a much more robust set of data and, and key performance indicators. So it's not as simple, again, as where's the data and what are the tools and what does it look like? It's what's the strategy? What's the process? What are you trying to gain? And the other, other final word of wisdom, uh, and you can take it for what it's worth, is, is that many times, and I see this in the development all the time, is we get 
we get bogged down in the amount of data that we're looking at. Um, I tell the story is, is that we had an HR director who wanted to stand up, who had 64 separate data elements that he thought was important. Uh, he called them down to 34. Well, you, you, can't, you can't drive decisions based upon that much information. So the, 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 what I had always done is when people came to me and asked me about, you know, geez, I'd really like to look at this variable, or I'd really like to look at this data element, my first question to them was, what critical decision are you going to make based upon this data? And if they couldn't answer that question, or if they could only answer it um, sort of in, in a manner that really that they had not thought it through very carefully, uh, then I would normally then say, no, we're not going to take a look at that data set. The resources that you have avail available to you to do this are limited. So particularly out of the blocks, curiosity is nice. And data discovery based upon curiosity is nice also, and there is a true value to that. But as you create your environment, land on the key metrics, the key indicators, and make sure it's, it's just a couple or three, four in each of the domains. You know, in HR, what do you need? Uh, you know, you need your turnover rate. You need time it takes to... Um, you know, what's your retention rate for staff? How long does it take to fill key positions, as an example? Three simple metrics that we can, but are there are key metrics in understanding some of the other challenges in the organization. So that's always the question. What decision are you going to make based upon this data? And if it's important and they can articulate it clearly, then that's a variable you need to bring forward into your analysis. Um, if it's nebulous and it doesn't drive any decision making, you know, put it in the parking lot for now. Um, there is this concept of data discovery where you sort of go down, you go down blind alleys and you look for relationships. And that sometimes that is the only way to get that is to take a look at non-critical data. When you're looking at relationships and trends and you find you find things out, you discover things you don't know, but that's a different process. That's not a dashboard. That's not a performance monitoring system. That's part of the BI and that's in your data discovery, but that's not your visualizations. Your visualizations should really speak to absolutely key metrics that you need to make the critical decisions in your environment and cross those across your different operational domains. Um, that would be my recommendation and create a strategy for doing that. So I don't, I'm not seeing any other questions and I've managed to pontificate for about 45 minutes. So please, thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, send your questions and your recommendations out to us. Um, and if we can continue this conversation going forward and if there's enough people interested, I think that uh, we would certainly uh, present that to MCTAC leadership to see if we can move this conversation forward to another level. So at that, I'm going to thank you very much for attending our office hours, and um, I hope that you found it useful and got you thinking uh, and maybe gave you a direction to move forward in. And hopefully we'll be speaking again sometime soon. So take care, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Um, and uh, thank you again. Bye now.